going on at um, Rutland Water. So uh, Tim is going to give us some highlights. Tim. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting me today. So for those that don't know me, I'm Tim Sexton. I'm the Senior Species and Recording Officer here at Rutland Water Nature Reserve. And it's my responsibility to coordinate the surveying effort across the site here at Rutland and then feed the data back into the management of the reserve. And I do that with the help of a massive team of volunteers um, that undertake the surveys um, uh, across the site. Just to give you a brief um, overview of some of the survey effort that we do in an average year. Um, this word cloud shows you the surveys that we've already done just this year alone. Uh, or that we plan to do by the end of the year. So you can just see just the vast sort of array of different surveys that are over undertaken by um, staff and volunteers here at the site, um, and all very valuable, as I say, feeds directly back into the, the, the management of the site. Now, the Wetland Bird Survey, the WEBS, is probably the most important survey that we undertake here at Rutland Water because it, the results feed directly back into the condition of the SPA, the Ramsar and the SSSI, the designated features of the reserve. It, we've got quite a huge data set. So it's been taken place um, on the site since 1975. So literally since the first water started to fill into the reservoir, um, the web survey has been undertaken. In fact, we next September, we'll be going into our 50th anniversary of, of the webs, and there are very few sites in Leicestershire and Rutland that have got such a big data set. So we've counted over five and a half million birds in that time. And what I've started to do, certainly in the last couple of years, is do some of the analysis of the long-term historic data to actually try and make sense of trends, how things are changing on the site, and how that perhaps relates to the management. And certainly some of the highlights in the last Webs year, uh, we've seen the highest count of teal in over 45 years. We've had 2,686 teal counted. We've had the highest counts of both great white egret and little egret, again, a species that's, you know, 15 years ago, would have had thousands of bird watchers come along just to see one great white egret, yet to see counts going into the roost um, last October of 75 great white egret and 145 little egret is just really incredible. Uh, we're yet to do this year's roost count, but I think it will be a very similar number. Um, and just very latest data in the last couple of weeks when we did the Oct October webs count, we had the highest count of little grebe in over 45 years. So that was um, 223. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the long-term trends, again, I'm no statistician, um, but can produce a, a nice looking graph on Excel. Um, this is the sum of the species maxima. So the sum of all the highest counts. Now, obviously with ducks, geese, grebes, the likes, water birds, the, the maximum count so it, it alters throughout the year. Um, so some species like shoveler, for instance, um, reach their peak in sort of October, in September, October. Um, Golden eye, for instance, much later in the uh, in the winter. But you can see we've seen a very slow, steady decline, but not by a huge amount. We're still well above the threshold for the SPA baseline um, and for the international importance, which makes up the the, the Ramsar designation. So it's quite a lot of peaks and troughs. And again, a lot of that will be partly down to changing climate. So as we see milder winter conditions, we're perhaps going to see fewer birds come across from the near continent to overwinter in the UK. And that's particularly true for species like coot and mallard, for instance. If we look at two of the, um, the, the designated features of the SBA uh, and the Ramsar designation, Shoveler and Gadwall are listed separately because in their own right, they reach numbers of international importance here at Rutland. Shoveler um, come to the UK in the winter, about 30% of the European population. Um, so it's a really important species. And uh, we have well over sort of 650 individuals, um, which is the threshold for international importance. Um, the, the threshold's been raised in recent years. I can't remember which year it was, but it was up from 450 individuals to 650. Um, but certainly in the last couple of years, uh, we've been achieving that figure again after a period of some 10 years when we we're quite below both the SPA baseline peak and also the minimum threshold for importance for um, shoveler. 
A very different picture, perhaps for Gadwall, we've seen a steady increase. Um, the latest five-year data from the BTO uh, shows that Rutland Water is the number one site in the UK for this species. So the last couple of year counts have been incredibly high. Like Shoveler, um, they come to the UK in about 30% of the European population to escape the cold um, winter months in their breeding areas, which are generally the Baltic states, particularly Latvia. Um, and we've seen, you know, again, the highest counts we've, we've pretty much had um, in the last 10 years over the last couple of uh, web seasons with Gadwall. Now, key to the favourable status of the SSSI here at Rutland Water is, of course, water quality monitoring, uh, which we've been doing quite a lot of in the last two or three years. Um, as Matt Carter alluded to earlier, you know, the number of species of invertebrate that are declining through poor water quality is quite uh, shocking at the moment in the UK, in both our still and, and running fresh waters. Um, we get frequent algal blooms in the many lagoons here. Many of the lagoons receive their water from uh, different sources. So we've been doing aquatic invertebrate surveys with a, a team of volunteers here using the BMWP uh, methodology. Um, we go out with the we get once every fortnight on a Friday, we go out with the survey and monitoring volunteer group. And the BMWP is quite a simple survey in that you're only identifying um, organisms down to family level. And each family is scored depending on their tolerance or intolerance of pollution or low oxygen in the water. Um, and you build up a score um, for each of the sites. Now with big lagoons, it's quite tricky because you have to do about 20 sample points per lagoon to ensure that you've sort of got a sample or representative sample of all the tiny meso habitats within each of those lagoons. Um, but because it's quite straightforward, we can train up volunteers to go off and pretty much do this on their own and they're building in their confidence day by day. Uh, back in 2022, we started a funded research project through Loughborough University, um, which is looking at, in more detail at the water chemistry, uh, the algal blooms, um, and to see what knock-on effects they might be having potentially in the future on, um, obviously, through the trophic levels all the way up to the, the wintering waterfowl, which is why we have the designation. We've also got through both Loughborough University and Nottingham Trent University the potential to look at the impacts or future impacts of invasive non-native species, uh, which particularly in the main reservoir, with the recreational use of the site, um, more and more species are, are starting to appear, particularly non-native gammarids, the shrimps, and also the quagga and the zebra mussels, which are really changing the um, ecology of the, the reservoir in a big way. Um, here's a picture of some of the volunteers doing the aquatic invertebrate sampling. Uh, some of the groups we take away to ID down to species level, so certainly the beetle. So this is uh, one of the, this screech beetle, um, Hygrobia hermanii. Um, and part of the work that Savannah's doing through the funded research project is also looking at reconstructing some of the historic water quality um, from a chemical point of view using... Um, using these silt, um, silt cores. Um, the Rutland Osprey project is certainly worth talking about today. I've had to pick out some of the, um, some of the important surveys. I'm sorry if I've missed out any that you're involved in, um, but the Rutland Osprey project's been taking place since um, the late 90s. Uh, we just had our 25th anniversary a couple of years ago, and we've hit another really important milestone this year. Um, so in 2023, we had 22 chicks from 10 nests, both in and around Rutland Water. Uh, three chicks fled from the Mountain Bay nest. And as I say, the important milestone we've just reached is we hit the 253rd osprey chick um, this year, since the pe first pair bred in 20, uh, 2001. Um, eight of the 19 chicks which fledged in 2021 have been identified in the UK this year. Um, which pre presents a 42% return rate, which is one of the highest return rates we've ever had of juveniles which have fledged from the local area. And in recent weeks, we've taken advantage of the low water levels to make some important repairs to the nest platforms and the perches. Uh, we've brought two nest sites within Rutland Water itself back into condition with the hope of expanding the population even further. 
Now, another really important um, tool for our, our sort of surveying at Rutland Water is the bird ringing. Um, I can give you a lot of data for last year, but we're still trying to pull together the data for this year. Obviously, we're still in the, the year at the moment. So last year, we had 5,598 birds of 51 species processed by staff and volunteers on the site. Uh, over 1,200 birds processed through the CES, the Constant Effort Scheme. This is a really important scheme in that it's systematic, it's repeatable and comparable. Um, and, and feeds back on 24 of the most common wetland and scrubland species of birds. And we've used this to confirm breeding of species like nightingale, which you can see there. Um, another really important uh, ringing survey that we do is the San Martin banks. We've got two artificial nesting banks, which provide opportunities for up to a thousand pairs of San Martins to nest. Uh, last year, um, we had a pretty unsuccessful year, really, to be honest. We had a third down in our productivity of chicks fledging, potentially due to the hot summer that we had in July, uh, when the temperature reached 40 degrees. Um, no birds went on to have third broods. Many of the eggs and the chicks that were still in the bank at that time literally cooked. Um, however, this year, the numbers picked up to more like what we'd expect to see. Um, we've ringed 1,475 chicks, which is... a I think the third highest total we've ever had from the banks. Um, but we also do another project relating to the San Martins, which is the RAS or Retrapping Adults for Survival. And that looks at the number of adult birds that return from previous years. And this year we had our highest count of returning birds. So we caught 400 birds during that study and over 90% were returning birds from the previous year. And you can see on the graph here, how um, the results of the RAS have just only gone from strength to strength in recent years. Now, one of our sort of new projects we've just started to look in, which relates to bird ringing in a way, is the MOTUS Wildlife Tracking System. And this is an international collaborative research network which uses radio frequency tags, automated radio telemetry to tag not only birds, but also bats and even insects in some countries. It's very popular in the States. It's very popular in continental Europe. And it's just starting to gain in popularity in the UK as a method for monitoring some of these um, species that are, are, are more elusive um, and you don't re get many recoveries for with traditional ringing methods. Uh, it's been funded at Rutland Water by numerous partners and local organisations from Elros to the local Bat Group, Rutland Natural History Society, the Rutland Local Group, the Bird Ringing Group, and cost about £5,000 to set up the monitoring station. We initially want to monitor other projects, but we're investigating opportunities and funding to start our own projects so we can actually start tagging species ourselves. And it would be ideal at Rutland Water for monitoring birds such as Jack Snipe, which is a project that's perhaps going to take place this winter um, to coincide with another ringing project that's taken place here, and also water rail. But more particularly, things like Nethusius pipistrelle. And this graph is taken from the MOTUS website, which shows the recoveries using MOTUS for Nethusius pipistrelle. Uh, it's one of our only truly migratory species of bats. Um, and through traditional ringing, we've had a retrap. I think it was ringed originally down in Essex and was retrapped as far away as Russia where it was caught by somebody's cat in a garden. But obviously, MOTUS, you don't need to retrap the individuals once you've initially tagged them. The tags are glued on, and after a period of about six months to a year, they're just molted off. So it doesn't affect the long-term um, survival of the birds or the bats that you're, that you're tagging. Um, there's an enthusiast pipistrelle that was ringed earlier this year at Rutland Water. Now, moth trapping is quite a big study that's been going on. Certainly, Ron Follows has been trapping in cherry wood for about 30 years now. Uh, we've got three permanent uh, moth trapping sites over the, the, the reserve. Last year, we had over 14,000 moths of 489 species recorded at the three trapping sites and also the Rothamstead trap. We've got 21 new species added to the reserve's moth list, which brings the list now up to 748 species. And that's not including the ones that we've trapped this year. Um, highlights for last year included things like treble brown spot, chevron, the orange conch, and also the early longhorn, Adela cuprella, which you can see pictured there, um, which um, comes out very early in the year, as the name suggests, early longhorn. 
and uh, lays its eggs onto sallows and the adults hover well above the trees and you sometimes have to be a bit inventive about the trapping method for, for being able to catch them. They fly during the day so they don't come to moth traps. So I had to um, basically convert a, a window cleaner's pole, extendable pole, with my sweep net attached to the end of it to try and catch those to confirm them as being the first for VC55 at the time. Um, we've had this year a new permanent moth trap installed at Linden, and what we've also been doing this year is more analysis of the Rothamsted trap. So the Rothamsted trap sits at the bird watching center. Um, it's a project that's done by the Rothamsted Research um, Institution, and it started in 1968 in the UK, and they operate a network of over 500 light traps across the length and breadth of the country. And next year, we'll be going into our 25th year of the Rothamsted trap operating at Rutland Water. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at um, some of the highlights over that period um, in preparation for that sort of celebration, if you like. There's the map of the network of light traps that have been operated in the UK. And you can see it's been a sort of mixed fortune for moths um, in, in the trap. So white ermines almost completely disappeared um, from the records in the last 25 years since the trap's been operating. It's been a very different story for the closely related dingy footman, which we've seen a huge increase, particularly um, last year when we had our highest count ever. Uh, and just to look at the overall figures over the last 25 years, you can see a slight decline, although certainly the last couple of years, the numbers of individuals that we're trapping has gone back up to sort of the 5,000 um, mark. Last year, we did a big uh, baseline beetle survey. Um, I've been uh, interested in Coleoptera for as long as I can remember. We teamed up with some fantastic volunteers, Steve Lane, Graham, and Anona Finch. And we basically went out to um, cover pretty much all areas of the nature reserve and pull together a baseline um, data set for the different species of beetles we have here. We did eight survey visits in total, and we recorded over 610 species of beetle in that time. And I've put there, we literally left no stone or cow pat unturned. So Steve quite often put on his gloves or not in some cases and dived into any potential um, beetle habitat that might be available. Um, in total, we had almost 70 species with a conservation status many of which are scarce wetland specialists, which just show how wonderfully the site has uh, matured in the last 45 years. This is a reed beetle called Donassia clavapes. I think the last record for VC55 before, I think three records turned up in one week the last year was 1935. So they've been absent for many, many years and obviously enhancing sites like this for wetland conservation just shows that it can have great successes. Uh, we've probably had about eight different species of uh, Donassianae, the reed beetle in total, and almost all of which are, are nationally important. We also had 22 new species for VC55. So this is a species of longhorn beetle called Pseudovedonia levida. It's quite unusual. Uh, it's called the fairy longhorn beetle, uh, fairy ring longhorn beetle is the common name for it. And unlike many of the longhorn um, beetles in the UK that lay their eggs and the larvae develop in deadwood, the larvae for this species actually develop in the humus um, infested by the fungus Marasmius oreades, which is the fairy ring champignon. And the beetle larvae feeds on the mycelium. So really quite interesting. Um, but it brings the records for beetles for the reserve up to 776 species, which makes it the most abundant recorded taxa at Rutland Water, well above the birds. Um, we've also been doing a really exciting novel project for small mammal uh, camera trap tunnels. Um, so this was an idea that was done on a reserve down in Bedfordshire. Uh, it's an entirely volunteer-led project. And what we've done is it, you, the... the um, the mammal tunnels use a specially modified trail cam. Uh, you can see in the bottom picture there with a macro lens um, attached to the um, trail camera um, itself uh, with some high-tech blue-tack. Uh, high 
Um, and it, what it means is the camera is able to focus in much more closely than it would do normally and gives us some really clear images of small mammals. It's far less invasive than Longworth trapping, which takes an individual out of its environment for up to six to eight hours at times, which perhaps during the breeding season isn't the best thing to do. Uh, we've been putting five tunnels in every location around 25 to 50 metres apart. And the idea and the aims of the project is to build up a small mammal atlas for the reserve. We've had 12 species of mammals recorded in total. Um, this is a water shrew, which we found to be um, very numerous across much of the sites uh, that we've surveyed to date, uh, which is really interesting because you wouldn't normally see them um, otherwise. Um, not all the mammals that we've been recording are small. We've had quite a lot of badgers try to poke most of their body into the uh, tunnel to get to the food inside. We've had otters, we've had squirrels, um, and we've also had, um, well, we've had a, a smooth newt the other day, which was quite an interesting find in a water rail. Um, every time we go out and check the cameras, there's over a thousand images um, per camera, per card. And we're looking for opportunities to use artificial intelligence to do analysis of the images. And now just to sort of finish off really to some of my personal highlights of the year. Uh, we talked a lot about moths um, today, but with butterflies, I um, was asked to cover um, the Lax Hill transect of the butterfly transects for Brian Webster uh, in June this year, so he could have a well-deserved holiday. And he was very annoyed when he came back to find that I'd had a green hair streak, which I think he's been doing the survey there for some 20 years now and has never seen one to date. It's quite an uncommon butterfly to see on the reserve. We see probably more purple hair streak and white letter hair streak than we do greens. Um, but they seem to be um, taking advantage of the dogwood in a newly planted area of woodland in Lax Hill. Um, I would have put the black hair streak, which um, one of our other volunteers had over near Gibbet Gorse, but it was just slightly off the reserve boundary itself. Um, so it doesn't really count. Grasshoppers and crickets. Sorry seen... to uh, interrupt you, Tim, but um, uh, uh, are you nearly finished? I'm nearly done, yeah. I'll just go That's through great. this list quickly. Yeah, thank okay, you. thank you. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Uh, so grasshoppers and crickets. We've had dark bush cricket scene in good number this year. Dragonflies and damselflies, lesser emperor we had recorded, but I wasn't able to get a photo of it. But willow emerald has um, just increased massively in abundance in the last two years. And our dragonfly and damselfly surveys that Tony Clark's undertaken, looking at all the ponds, have found them to be present at pretty much all of the 23 smaller ponds on the reserve. Um, true flies, we had this species, Mersomia westmanii, which is um, a fruit fly that uh, feeds on... Uh, ragwort is nationally notable and quite an attractive looking thing. And there's only two or three other records in BC 55. Uh, beetles, we've had plenty. This one was just off the reserve at Ketton Quarry when we did a survey for Sarah Bedford, the reserve manager there. And this is Mogulones geographicus, which you find on uh, Vipers Bugloss. We had the first record of um, common lizard on the reserve this year after a reintroduction or a translocation project some 15 years ago. We'd not had any record since the translocation project, thought it had failed, and then we had about three records this year. Mammals, well, we had did some longworth trapping. In fact, in fact, I think it was late last year, but we had a harvest mouse recorded, which is really cool because you don't often catch them in longworth traps. A bit on the birds, it would have to be the great white egret. Um, I don't think I've been anywhere in the world and seen so many as I'd seen in front of Crake Hyde. I think I counted 24. Uh, we had magpie ink cap recorded for the first time on the reserve in Barnsdale Wood, a great um, ancient woodland indicator species. In terms of plants, well, there's not many super rare plants recorded in the last year, but I love mudwort, which appears in the drawdown zones. It's quite local. You only tend to find it at Rutland Water and I think probably one other site in the, the, the Vice County. Uh, in terms of Hymenoptera, um, it would have to be this. And you're probably thinking right now that's a ladybird, not a wasp. Uh, but in fact, it's a wasp, Dinocampus uh, cochinelle, which parasitizes ladybirds. And I read that one on just to see the actual um, wasp itself. Um, and I'll finish off by saying that we'll be producing, the, well, the, 
report for the last year has been produced and will be appearing on our website very shortly. If you go onto lrwt.org.uk and go onto the, the water page, you'll be able to see all the highlights of the year in full. So thank you ever so much. And uh, I'll switch back on. Uh, many thanks, Tim. Uh, once again, uh, too much.